My first vivid memory at Carleton was actually a freshman registration. I remember them handing us a mug, like very much like this, that said Carleton alumni. And I looked at the person next to me and I said, what if you don't graduate? So you have to give it back. <laughs> <laughs> For me, that was that was a joke because I came from a middle class Jewish suburban family of doctors and social workers and education was paramount. I mean, there, there was no choice about college except which one to go to. So I applied to Carleton um, purely because my sister had been accepted here. So it was a matter of sibling rivalry, proving I could get in. I did, and but had no intention at all of coming. It was her school, but I did come for a spring visit and um, loved it. And you know, was kind of convinced we could lead separate lives. And we really did. So um, um, on January fifteenth, nineteen eighty-five. Um, it was exactly two weeks into winter term, sophomore year, and I was summoned to Dean Rosenrod's office, and he just, I had never met him before, so he just kind of greeted me and said, you know, your father called with some very bad news, your mother killed herself this morning. And so to me, these words did not register, you know, killed herself, what is, what is that? You know, um, it, and even if I could, con sorry, I'd go back. Even if I could comprehend what had happened, it didn't fit her. She was strong, she was educated, you know, she was, she was an advocate for people in need, and, and she was the core of our family, you know, she was fiercely devoted to, to the idea of family, and not the type, you know, everybody thinks there's a type that commits suicide, and um, she wasn't that. So with that, nothing made sense to me anymore, you know, the world just fell away. So, and, but as I was leaving, the dean asked, um, do you want to wait while we find your sister so you can be here while we tell her? And I actually said no, and left, and went back to that. Um, and then later that day, you know, they coordinated a ride for us, and we traveled home together um, in complete silence. I mean, maybe we said, like, oh, watch this, I have to go to the bathroom. But that was about it, and, um, you know, we lost in our own thoughts or whatever. And so um, when we got home, my dad took us to the den and kind of sat us down and ran through the details of the day and showed us the note that my mom left. And then, oh, I'm so not kidding. <laughs> 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 so, so that's the 70s family. That's the first day of Carlton. Um, that's my mom. Um, where am I? That's me and Leah not talking. Um, so we're in the den with my dad, and then, so, oh wait, I'm too far. Okay, so we're in the den with my dad, he's telling us everything that's going on, and, um, what happens? Uh, sorry, I'll confuse myself. This is what we're saying. Okay, so, um, oh, oh, when he was down, we just basically went, each went to our own rooms, and uh, did nothing, you know, just, Tried to go to sleep or whatever. So the next morning, I sat in the kitchen as he called everybody, um, friends, family, whatever, and I just listened to the story over and over, and I created this very succinct narrative of facts that just stuck with me. It became my narrative for 30 years, both about the circumstances of her death and the why behind it. Um, so, and this is this is essentially what I said, which was that she had lymphoma, um, and she became depressed when she was undergoing pretty serious chemo and obsessed with the fact that she was that she was holding my dad back from like a prestigious new job and that she was distracting my sister and I from our studies. And so, you know, she was a social worker and it was in her soul and she couldn't help anybody, she couldn't work, so she felt useless. And on top of that, she now needed help and it was just intolerable to her. So, um, you know, for her, we saw it as an it was her act of control, her last act of control, and the reason behind it was just to mitigate the damage that she felt she was, she was causing to the family. Um, and her, oh, sorry, that's her. And then this was part of her suicide note, um, and this was the line that kind of stuck with everybody. She said, cry over me, bury me, mourn me, and then get on with your healthy lives. So to do that, my father, the day after the funeral, brought me and my sister back to Carleton and dropped us off and simply said, well, move forward. Um, my brain and my emotions did not compete that very well. Um, and I actually do not remember ever stepping foot into a classroom again. I searched the halls for people to play a trivial pursuit with. I went up to the 
Sales Hill to see if Luke was ever going to find Laura. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was my schedule, my new schedule. And my sister and I didn't speak. We didn't see each other out for any reason. So I obviously felt very. And somebody, my one of my freshman year roommates, told me. I said, "How was it?" And she goes, "You just shut down." So um, there you go. So. Um, you know, I felt alone and I felt directionless, um, but I was also very conscious of suddenly being free. Um, so, sorry. So, um, we didn't take each other out, and I, I, was, I, was, I felt free, and I felt guilty for feeling free, but the fact was, I was. You know, the woman, the, the person I saw that would maybe be here, you know, and was sort of directing my course of study, um, had just ditched, you know, she abandoned her post, so why should I have to stay? So against everyone's advice, I did take leave of absence, and um, I moved back home. I developed a very cordial but awkward relationship with my father, very much like roommates who don't really want to be living together. Um, and then I worked at a record store in a mall, and that was fun. Um, and then as family, friends, and school advisors predicted I never did return. So, um, later that year, I was blindsided when um, my father became engaged in September. The wedding was January 1986. It was one year and 10 days after we buried my mother. But my mother's entire family came to the festivities and actually seemed very delighted by what was going on. I saw this as evidence that I was the only one that still had feelings about what had happened and that um, everybody else actually had moved on. So, you know, I went my merry way. I, I went to New York, built a successful career in, in the television industry, and in, which was a wonderful distraction for me. Those kind of jobs can consume your life. I was often on location, which, you know, allowed me not to think about anything. As long as I was not in the place I was calling home, I didn't have to think about anything. So, um, but because the problem was when I did think, I saw myself as an emotionally stunted and quite immature 19 year old. And over the years, I continued to have very poor self-care skills. Um, I have aversion to adult norms like getting married, owning a house, having children. Um, and I've kind of built a, light, a life that has allowed me not to have to grow up. So um, as that was happening, I did see therapy a few times, but usually only you know immediate crisis. I go three or four times, feel a little bit better, and call it off. And if anybody ever asked me, you know, wanted to talk about my mom and how that affected me, I just said, I get it. Like I understand why she did it, so it can't be a problem. Um, but as the years passed, um, I sort of devolved into a very depressed and burnt out freelancer with no real interests, plans, or goals. Um, my mom died at age 47, and people had told me it would be very surreal to come up on that age, and it was. Um, even more surreal was I had a massive panic attack in a Target a few months prior to my big day, and um, it kind of just went down, and then um, an ambulance took me out. And that was the beginning um, of a very deep depression, and I just was drained of any coping skills. Like, I just could not figure out anything to do with myself. Um, so I knew, you know, at this point, you know, what are the options? Like, just go down the path of misery or, and, you know, and unproductiveness, unproductivity, or just, you know, or actually get help. Because now I was also kind of curious, what was wrong with me? You know, all these years, like, I could see how the decline had happened, and so I wanted to find out. So I finally did engage in therapy, and it slowly woke me up to the fact that while I did intellectually understand my, su my mother's suicide, I, didn't, I had never coped with her loss, which is something completely different. While the suicide instigated the change in the family, it was the shutdown afterwards, the emotional shutdown and the verbal shutdown that really kind of hijacked what could have been a you know, fairly, hopefully normal life. But, um, you know, struggling through all of it alone, and grief alone, and in the silence, I believe, was at the heart of, of what took me down. So as I wobbled back to life, um, you know, it was good getting there for a couple of years, and then I approached 50, and like everybody else, I started asking, you know, what am I doing, what's happening, there's got to be something more. 
I was I was bored and restless, like I couldn't even pretend to be interested in my job anymore. And so um, I uh, saw a posting for they needed volunteers to help out at a charity walk for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And um, you know, I kind of challenged myself and like put up or shut up. And so I signed up. Um, and so at the walk, I immediately discovered this group of people that it was so different and such a relief and easy to talk to because um, they had also survived suicide loss. You know, I always told people when they asked how my mom died that it was cancer related. And over the years, you know, I told a few close people the full story, but it was always this whole discussion of having to explain she was a proud, strong woman, you know, she was desperate to help us and, and just qualify it on and on and on. So um, here, it, it was nothing like that. It was it was like an, an initiation, or not an initiation, an unconditional entree into this club, you know? And it was tragic how many people were in it, but there it was. So, um, you know, uh, sorry. Um, but, and like here, it, you know, it reminded me, I was saying this to somebody yesterday, it's a lot like a reunion, I think. It's just that shared history that connects you no matter what. And you will tell a complete stranger your entire story that you wouldn't tell your best friend. You know, it's a, it's a fascinating concept. So um, anyway, so it was, it was a really eye-opening experience for me and I felt like more connected to these people in one afternoon than I did to my family. So it really lit this, this kind of unknown spark I had. And um, I jumped into the new world. I started volunteering you know, full-time pretty much, and I actually joined the board of our chapter. I joined a support group, which I'd never done before, um, for suicide loss survivors, and it, a lot of them were newly bereaved, but for me, it helped me go back and remember and process the emotions and questions that I never had. Um, and so, you know, I experienced for the first time talking really is healing. Um, I was forced to reconsider my opinion of my family that they were just a bunch of unemotional freaks very quickly because so many people I met had almost the same exact story, um, especially people of our generation are older. You know, it was everything from the silence to the screw ups. There's a pattern of what happens, and um, I joked and I joked to someone that because my last name's Golden that in my house silence is golden, and I had a flash. <laughs> of an idea and my little spark caught fire and I decided to do a documentary in which I would get my family to speak for the first time. And you know, it's they're all getting older. You know, luckily a lot of them are still alive. But they're getting older, but you know, I add, the more I talked about it, the more I realized how much I was missing from my story and how I had never, like truly never considered their point of view, their experience, their perspective. So um, the producer in me was also inspired. Um, I decided to put the expertise I, I um, created over 25 years telling other people's stories on a project that I was finding something I was passionate about. Um, you know, I see it kind of as a cautionary tale, and that, but the ending was still unknown because I didn't know what would happen when I did talk. I went through a little more therapy to build up the courage to talk. Um, I was not, I had kind of a physical reaction to the idea, but I persevered, contacted my father, was surprised how quickly he just, he's like 100%, let's do it, contacted everybody else I wanted to talk to. One of my mom's friends actually said, I've been waiting for this letter for 30 years. So um, that summer I did an initial round of interviews and I was astonished. The conversations were all natural, they were comfortable, they flowed. There were a lot of tears, but it never stopped. It never cut off a conversation. Um, I learned important details that have been missing from my narrative, primarily that um, my mom's cancer was terminal, the fact that it had been kept from us. The serious, that it was her idea that they keep the seriousness of us. It was this whole thing about not distracting us from school. So all these memories, judgments, things I held, hurts I held for so long, I found the real answers. and. I could, they could have been solved, which is a question, but I was unwilling to ask or unable to ask. So anyway, it turns out my, my sister, who stayed at Carleton, um, it, for her it was a refuge, and they actually, the counseling center that year actually formed a support group because a couple of other students had lost, um, had lost parents. So, you know, the reasons for the silence varied from it's a generational norm, you don't talk about things, to, um, to, um, the, you know, you don't want to hurt it. you don't want to make them comfortable, you don't want to open old wounds, all that. But um, since I've talked, is that, 
you know, it's it's nothing magical has happened, you know, nothing horrible happened, nothing magical happened, but everything's just easier. I feel lighter, you know, when I'm on the phone with my dad, it feels like I'm actually just talking to somebody instead of like pushing for answers, you know, it's just, it's those kind of things. And um, a lot, of, I was at a conference and a, a, for law survivors and there was a quote by an actress who's in the 50s uh, named Dolores Hart, who turned, went to be a nun, um, and she said, she. The quote was, "Once deepest wounds integrated become one greatest powers. So to me, my wound is my story, and telling it has become my power, and now it's really become my mission. Um, this is, I want to go forward, and just, you know, I have a purpose. It gives me satisfaction, and it's weird to say, but working in the world of suicide is making me happy. Um, <laughs> yeah, my Carlton career was derailed. Um, after my mom's death, and but I've always felt connected through friends, through the Carltonian, through use for money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be back 30 years later, it's, I can't even describe, I won't try, this full circle feeling of, you know, because timing wise, it's like it's been a year and a half since I really started this. So, like from sophomore to senior, this feels like my graduation. And um, I actually feel like. I'm, I'm growing up a little, and I'm ready to take what I've learned out into the world now and use my voice to help others. And, you know, I don't drink coffee because that's very adult, but if I ever do, <laughs> I will start using my mind. <laughs>